Thank you. Please put your hands together, folks, for James Johnson. Yeah. Great. Well, thank, thank you all very much. And um, I was a student here um, over, 50, over 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, walk, walk, walking up here from the station this evening in the darkness and the rain and no traffic about. I thought, okay, I'm back in Aberdeen. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. I love Aberdeen. So I had a wonderful time here, and it's, uh, it's a great city. Don't think he ever came here. I think he went to lots of other places, but I don't think Aberdeen was. Well, he probably came here, but he didn't do anything significant in Aberdeen. Who knows anything about him? Just a show of hands. It's really interesting to see. No, no, no. So this is. This is a kind of crime, really. I mean, it's not a crime that you've committed, but the fact that this man isn't more widely known about in Scotland is just extraordinary. And there are reasons, I think, why he isn't, um, and I'll come to that. But, um, so, I'm, I'm going to start, I'm, I mean, I'm going to tell you about his life and how I became involved in it. Um, and a good place to start this story is when he was um, 17, and he'd, um, so his name is Robert Bontine Cunningham Graham. <clears throat> so I'm not going to start right at the beginning, we'll come back to the beginning. But he had been taken away from school because his father had gone, his father basically went mad, uh, and spent all the family money. So Robert had been at sent away to boarding school in England, and he was taken away from school when he was 17, and he decided that he was going to go to South America to try and make his fortune and win back the family fortune. And m most of his contemporaries would have gone into the army or the clergy or gone and worked for one of the big sort of trading houses in the Far East. But he, he kind of, this, he, he set the tone for his life by doing the opposite of what everyone else did. He thought, I'm going to go to South America. So this was in 1870, uh, the year 1870, and he was just short of his 18th birthday. And South America, there were a lot of Scots in Argentina at that time who'd gone out to start ranching. So the ranching business was just starting to, to gather pace. They hadn't, yet, they hadn't yet started breeding cattle for beef. They were still breeding them for leather at that point. Um, so they hadn't invented, the refrigerated transport hadn't quite arrived. So the, the big exports of beef from Argentina were maybe 20 years in the future. Anyway, so there were a lot of quite tough Scots out there who were making a living um, <clears throat> breeding, breeding cattle. And Robert thought that he was going to go out there and make his fortune. So he, um, he, took, he took a ship from Liverpool to Rio de Janeiro. And the ship was called SS Patagonia. And I found the very ship on the internet. And there it is putting into Rio Harbour. You can see the Sugarloaf Mountain in the back. So he's just had his 18th birthday on board the ship. And he's going out to work with a couple of Scots brothers from Angus who were running an estancia, a cattle branch, in Argentina. And he's traveling out with one of them who had been home on leave. And they hadn't been at sea for very long when, when Robert started to wonder whether things were going quite according to plan because the young man he was traveling with, James Ogilvy, had locked himself in his cabin and there was a lot of clinking of bottles and a strong smell of alcohol coming out of his cabin. Um, so Robert was understandably a little bit apprehensive about how things were going to turn out. They arrived in, Buenos Aires, in Rio and then they went on to Montevideo in um, <clears throat> in Uruguay, which was where you landed. And then they took, they took a boat up, <clears throat> up country to that area that's called Mesopotamia, which is between the two big rivers, the Uruguay and the Paraná, which are two mighty rivers in that part of South America. And it's very fertile, so there's a lot of um, <clears throat> good grassland there. And he, so they traveled up there about a thousand miles from Montevideo, and um, they got to the ranch and they discovered the place, Robert discovered that the other, the other brother, the brother who hadn't been home to Scotland, was also um, an alcoholic, and the place was in ruins. And to make things worse, there was, an, there was a severe drought and a, and a very brutal civil war going on. So this, he, he, he was now 18 by about a month. 
and he landed in this part of South America where it was chaos, basically. Um, he was a very resourceful young man, and he was, as it turned out, he was also very courageous, I think very physically courageous. So he had a very, he had a, he spent the next six of the next eight years in South America. The place really got under his skin. Um, he wrote home, he wrote a lot of letters home telling his mother, poor mother, how awful things were. <laughs> so his mum sitting in Scotland with her 18 year old, 6,000 miles away, getting these letters saying, there's a civil war, a horse fell on me, all these terrible things that happened to him. <clears throat> and he wrote home, he said, uh, about Argentina, he said nothing but grass, because he became a writer. So this is, there were, there, were, there, were, there were two main parts to his life, one politics and the second part was writing. So the second part of his life, he was a writer and he wrote a lot about his early experiences. So about Argentina, he said nothing but grass and sky and sky and grass, and then still more grass and still more sky. For months, the revolution had been going on, the rival bands roaming about and stealing horses, slaughtering the cattle, and now and then, if they could catch a man or two alone, cutting their throats just as they cut a sheep's, driving the knife in at the point with the edge outwards and bending back the head. Nice stuff. So he very quickly learned to... Oops. He very quickly learned... He already knew how to ride. and He'd, 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 had, um, he'd ridden as a child, but he became a very good horseman very quickly. Because you had to. In those days, a horse was the only way to get anywhere in, in that part of South America. There were barely any roads because there was no, there were, um, mechanization hadn't arrived really. <clears throat> um, so you had to ride, you had to ride everywhere. And he spent a lot of time with the gauchos who were the cowboys of, of that part of South America. And I mean, we think of them today as simply being cowboys, but they were actually ethnically distinct. They were, they were mixed race. They were part European and part Guarani Indian, who were the local Indians. Um, and they were a law unto themselves. They were, they were very wild. They, <clears throat> they were very quick with their knives. They lived almost entirely off the cattle that they, that they, um, that they herded. So they were kind of stockmen for hire. And they at, they, at the beef, they used the skins to make clothes. They even they burnt the bones. They sat on the skulls, so nothing of the cat the cow was wasted. And they lived a kind of nomadic life. And Robert spent a lot of time with them. So he's this young eighteen year old Scotsman, who's really living with these very wild, <clears throat> wild um, nomadic uh, cattle herders. And uh, so he very quickly he goes native, and he adopts their dress and. As we go through the, the story, you'll, you'll come to re appreciate that he was very conscious of his appearance. I mean, he was a very good-looking man. And even at this age, he, he liked to dress up and have a special take it. And this is him <clears throat> as in wearing, wearing the, gaucho, the gaucho clothes. And he spent three periods, different periods in South America, all during his 20s. And the reason it's important to talk about them is because they, they, they shaped the man he would, he would later become. And they were very influential in his political thinking, as, uh, uh, apart from a number of other things. The first trip, he was there for about 18 months and he went home again. He got very ill. He got typhoid, um, <clears throat> going to the rescue of a neighboring farmer who had, who had fallen ill. And he picked up medicine and rode across the river got drenched, there was a storm, spent the night at the man's bedside and then went down to typhoid and was very ill and actually his mother didn't hear from him for about four months and was kind of <clears throat> going, going, um, going crazy with worry and then he turned up again. Second time he went back, um, he went back to investigate the possibility for growing mate, which is the drink, it's this kind of green tea that they all drink in that part of South America. Um, and it's, it's very bitter, um, but it's a, it, the, the making of the, of the mate is a kind of ritual, and they use these little, it's a, it's a gourd, it's a vegetable, um, <clears throat> uh, the big seed of a vegetable gourd with a silver rim around it, and then the, the drinking straw, which has got a perforated bowl, so you can put it in the liquid and get the liquid without getting the leaves up the, up the straw. Um, 
So he went to Paraguay. He got a commission from a London firm to go to Paraguay and see if they could, if he could find a place to, to cultivate this mate. Um, but when he got there, he found that the place was in ruins because, again, there had been a war. And this time, Paraguay in the 1870s had been at war simultaneously with Bolivia, Argentina, and Brazil, its three neighbors. And it was called the War of the Triple Alliance. And it was, I think, proportionately the most destructive war ever waged in terms of how many people died. So there was a, there was a population of about, I don't know, half a million people at that time. And two thirds of the men were killed in this war. I mean, it was really, really terrible. So he arrived again. He had a habit of arriving in places that were either about to blow up or had recently blown up. And uh, Paraguay turned out to be not much good for um, any commercial prospect. Much later on, he had a photograph, this photograph taken, I suppose he's probably in his maybe 40s, late 40s there. And the first time I saw it, I thought he was smoking a pipe. You can see, I don't know whether this is, is this point of working. No, it's, no, it's not. Um, but in fact, he's actually, he's, he's drinking mate. And again, you can see the, the decoration around it, the, the rim of the bowl. But I, mean, I think, I, re I really think he looks like the, the, um, the, the eighth man of the Magnificent Seven. You know, Yul Brynner is just about to, to come in the shop. He looks very cool in that picture. I think he probably knew it. Um, Sorry. Um, so Paraguay was in, a, was in a state of chaos, and because all the men had been killed, the, uh, there were no hunters. So there was a proliferation of wild animals, and he was riding through jungle and um, <clears throat> in constant danger from, from, from wild animals or bandits or turning up in villages where there were no men left. And if you, turn, if you arrived there as the only man, the women would pounce on you. Um, so, I, so I think there were stories of lone travellers sleeping in the woods for the night because they didn't dare go into the villages. Um, but one thing he did get interested in were the Jesuits, who um, were the Catholic um, sect, I suppose. I don't know how you describe it. Ultra-Catholics. Ultra -Catholics. And they, they had set up in that part of South America, in Paraguay, and they'd taken under their protection the local, the local Guarani, the, ind the indigenous people, who were at danger from... I mean, they, 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 were, they were really being enslaved and very, very badly treated by most of the other Europeans, also by slavers from Brazil who used to come across the border and catch them. And Robert quite unfashionably thought that the Jesuits had actually done a good deed in that part of the world because they protected the, the native people from, from, um, from a, a worse fate. Um, and he later wrote a book about Paraguay called A Vanished Arcadia uh, about the Jesuits, which was the basis for the film The Mission. I don't know whether any of you remember that. with Jeremy Irons and um, De Niro and Jeremy Irons. So that was based largely on, on Robert's book about that time, <clears throat> that time in Paraguay. So two trips. The third trip, he got involved in a, a disastrous um, horse buying and selling ex, ex, uh, expedition. So all his commercial ventures were a complete failure, and they continued to be a failure throughout his life. He never restored the family fortune, um, and he was constantly on the lookout for a, for, for a good thing as he wrote home to his mother. I, I, I see my way to a good thing, he said more than once, and her heart must have sunk when she read this. Oh God, he's off on some other mad expedition. This time it was to buy horses in Uruguay and drive them up to Brazil and sell them to the Brazilian army at a huge profit. But he hadn't bargained on the fact that halfway up, halfway along the journey, there was an area of impenetrable forest that it would take him a year to get through. And on the other side of it, there was pasture that was salted and killed the horses. So, so um, he never, they all, by the time he got to the forest, most of them had died of snake bite or drowned in rivers anyway. So that was a disaster. But he had had eight very, very, six very eventful years in South America. He was still only just in his, in his 20s. And when he left, he left with, he left with three things. He left with 
this brand, which was the cattle, which was the brand that he had been given by the gauchos to brand his own animals with, when he, particularly when he had horses. And actually, without the circle around the stem, it had been the brand of an assassinated gaucho leader. <clears throat> so he took it, they gave it to him. I think as a mark of respect, actually, because they also gave him a nickname, which was Don Roberto, which is how he came to be known as Don Roberto. Um, because he had proved himself to be a very, um, <clears throat> a very, very courageous, very physically courageous, and uh, had kind of lived with them and ridden with them. And you know, if you fell off your horse when you were out in the wilds in Argentina in the 1870s, you probably died because you were either too far from anywhere to get help, or you were you were attacked by feral cattle, or you were picked up by bandits. So there was a very real chance of death a lot of the time that you were in the saddle. So they gave him the brand, they gave him the nickname, <clears throat> and he also, although he didn't realize it at the time, had stored up an incredible treasury of stories that he was then going to go back and much later was going to write. <clears throat> um, so, <clears throat> who was he? Well, this is him in his 80s. He was my mother's great uncle. My great, great uncle. Um, <clears throat> and she was eight. He died in 19... He was born in 1852 and he died in 1936. He was eight when my mother died. Uh, when, sorry, my mother was eight when he died. Little girl. Um, and sadly, she had really... She had succumbed to dementia before I really got going with this book. I mean, I'd known about him all my life. But, of course, as always happens in families, I didn't ask the questions I should have done. But I did, just before she died, I asked her what he was like, if she remembered what he was like. <clears throat> she said um, he was very brisk and rather bouncy. That was how she described him in her, in her final years. And I can imagine that, I mean, he, he, certainly, he certainly liked horses better than he liked small children. I'm quite sure of that. Um, and I can imagine that he might have seemed quite... Um, Quite, quite awe-inspiring to a little girl. Um, he's, yeah, he was a great, he was a great animal lover, and um, it's quite circumspect about humans on the whole. But she would have heard about him at this at this house, which is on the backs of the Clyde between um, between uh, Dumbarton and Cardross. It's a house called Ardach. There are lots of Ardachs, but this is that particular one, um, and it had been built by a great great grandfather of his who came back from the West Indies um, having made his money I'm ashamed to say the way that many people made their money in the West Indies through, well he was a collector of taxes but he had slaves um, so that house actually was <clears throat> it's a small house it's a very it's a lovely house my grand, my, he died in 1936 and left it to my grandparents, my grandfather, who he, he died childless, so my grandfather was his heir. Uh, and um, that's where my mother spent quite a lot of her childhood. And we used to go over there a lot when I was a child. And, uh, <clears throat> I mean, my grandparents by then had kind of really put their, made their mark on the place. I mean, they'd been there for 15 years or so by the time I was, by the time I was born. Um, but... <clears throat> There were still traces of him, and there was a room round the corner from there, which, is, which was known as the book room, which was his study, I suppose. And it was full of tall shelves, full of books. Um, and I remember going in there as a little boy and just looking at all these books, and there was a bronze bust of him on a table there. So, I mean, I kind of was... You know, his presence was there, and I could start as a child to, to, to soak it up. Um, and then some of the books would have come from this house, which was the family house called Gartmore, which is in um, west of Stirling, at the far end of the castle of Stirling. It looks over the Lake of Menteith. So there's a village called Gartmore uh, just beyond the Lake of Menteith, and that sits up above, <clears throat> above Gartmore. And that's, a, that's an Adam house, but the bit of the top was, was put on by the family who bought it from, from, from him when he had to sell it eventually. So it didn't have that top story. The people who bought it were shipbuilders and they had the skills to be able to stick a, an extra story on a big house like 
Um, but that's where he that's where he would have spent quite a lot of his childhood. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, I was I learned a lot about him from my mother. I mean, in fact, he was he was um, he was her role model really. He he was he was quixotic. I mean, that's a cartoon of him as Quixote by one of his one of the people who who wrote his biography, who was another great horseman, Swiss called Chifeni. Um but he was chivalrous, you know, he was dashingly handsome, he was aristocratic, he was a champion of underdogs everywhere, and an espouser of lost causes. Um, and he was a politician and a writer and a horseman and a traveller. And he was painted by, he was sculpted by Epstein, he was painted by John Lavery, who was the famous sort of society portrait painter of that time. And that picture is in the, it's a full-length portrait, it's absolutely magnificent, it's in the Kelvin Grove in Glasgow. Um, <clears throat> that's obviously him uh, later in life, but you can see again. I mean, you, you, you can see how you can see the appearance, the attention to, to clothes and his moustaches and, and the shine in his boots and everything. Um, so <clears throat> he was he was also um, he was caricatured by Spy, who was a political cartoonist. He was a friend. He was fictionalized by George Bernard Shaw. He appeared as a character in two of Shaw's plays. He was a friend of Oscar Wilde and H.G. Wells. Um, he knew Thomas Hardy, John Macefield, G.K. Chesterton. And most importantly of all, in that area of his life, he was the literary mentor to Joseph Conrad. So Conrad um, had Conrad started writing. He, he, he arrived in England from having been at sea. Had a, he had also had a very adventurous life and had sailed around the world as a merchantman. And he'd landed up in England and started writing, and Robert read something that he'd written in a journal, in a magazine, <clears throat> thought it was very good, wrote to him. And they started a correspondence, and then they met, and they became best friends, and they remained best friends until Conrad died. And they corresponded, and I think they were the, respectively the two people to whom they bared their, their souls. Um, they were very, very close indeed. And Robert really got Conrad going as, a, as an author, although, of course, he became a much, much bigger figure than, than Robert did in his day. Um, but the list of his achievements goes on and on, and, um, and my mother also went on and on and on and on. And by the time I was about 10, I never read it until I was because I'd been fed it for breakfast, lunch, and tea, and um, I, I was sick to death of it. And, I mean, it's, a, you know, how, how not to... And not to um, inspire the next generation in, in, a, in an illustrious ancestor. My mother won the prize for that. She eventually wrote her own book about him, <clears throat> uh, which was published in 2004. And her book is a kind of it's a kind of hybrid. It's half biography, but it's half it's half imagined um, scenes from his life, conversations with his wife, and so on and so forth. That picture also is by John Lavery, and that picture is in the Presidential Palace in Buenos Aires, in, in the Argentine Presidential Palace. And he's revered in Argentina to this day, really, because once he came to write, he wrote about that period of the Gauchos, which when they were on the cusp, because within about 10 years of him leaving, the railway had arrived, the telegraph had arrived, and people had started closing land and putting up fences. So the Gauchos really no longer, they had nowhere to go. And they're that very old way of life, they'd been leading for probably two or three hundred years, um, disappeared. And Robert, Robert was the person who chronicled that. So he's, he's greatly admired in Argentina for having done that. Um, <clears throat> so my mother wrote her book, uh, and then she let go. And I had sworn that I would never, ever be involved with it. Uh, and uh, it was really strange. <laughs> She let go and she started to get dementia. And I just found myself kind of being sucked into the vacuum. And, and despite, despite resisting it, I, I, there came a point that I realized there was no point in trying to resist it any longer. And I was encouraged to give a talk about it by somebody who, who actually gave me a, a platform to do it. And said, right, you've got to, here's a date, here's the, here's the event, come and talk about it. And so I gave the talk and I realized that actually, a, I enjoyed giving the talk, and B, the more I found out about him, the more amazed I was by what I found out. 
and so the talk eventually turned into in, into the into the book. Um, but my mum had let go by that stage, um, <clears throat> and um, I I. I got really interested in him around about 2013, just so the, the referendum had been announced, um, and I realised that I felt very strongly about independence, and um, it was, and then I realised, of course, you know, I've got this guy peering over my shoulder, I need to find out more about him. Um, <clears throat> and he's there, there he is, he's speaking at Bannockburn. At, they used to have an annual an annual gathering in Elversley, I think, is where the, the gathering was held on Bannockburn Day. And he's there in his late eighties, so this would have been after the founding of the National Party of Scotland. So probably um, nineteen around about nineteen thirty, I would think. Uh, and he's still he's still got the oratorical touch and the the style. I think his voice was probably getting a bit frail by then. Um, but there are various. Um, Worthies in in the crowd, the one in the kilt, I think, is the Duke of Montrose, <clears throat> who was an early nationalist, but then kind of veered right and went off on his own his own kind of course, <clears throat> which didn't really sit very well with the mainstream. Um, and they, but they were kinsmen, in fact, because he was a, he he was also a Graham. But anyway, so the more I found out about him, the more amazed I was. <clears throat> His friend Joseph Conrad, who, who as I said, had led a very adventurous life, wrote about wrote to Robert. Um, when I think of you, I feel as though I have lived all my life in a dark hole without seeing or knowing anything. So Conrad knew that Robert was something pretty extraordinary, uh, and, and, and said so. Um, but it's very difficult in a short talk to, 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 to give an impression of such an enormous life. But uh, <clears throat> where did he come from? Um, this is him again, I think, probably in his 60s. And he was still adventuring. We'll come to that when he was that age. Um, he was, <clears throat> through, his, through his Graham ancestors, he was a direct descendant of Robert II of Scotland. And... Um, he was, according to several authorities, a, a, a legitimate claimant. In fact, the only, the only real legitimate claim to the Scottish throne. Um, so, I mean, as a child, this was a great joke, you can imagine, that he was, he should have been king of Scotland. Um, <clears throat> but um, it was even suggested that he, um, uh, <clears throat> Yes, it was suggested that he might be Robert the Fourth of Scotland and Robert the First of Great Britain and Ireland, which didn't look quite nice. That's ambitious. That's ambitious. Well, we can leave. We can, we can leave the second part. But anyway, just 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 have Robert the Fourth of Scotland. That would that would do. Um, so his father um, <clears throat> was a young cavalry officer called William. Well, well his the family name was Cunningham Brown, but he was called Bonteen because there was an entail, which meant that. In order to inherit a um, an estate, he had to <clears throat> he had to carry the surname Bontine until his father died. I mean, it's a it, 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 it's a detail, but that's where the Bontine in Robert Bontine Gunn and Graham comes from. And he was <clears throat> he fell off his horse or was hit on the head, and we don't know which. Um, when he was a young cavalry officer in Ireland. So I mean, he was serving with, a, with an English cavalry regiment and was sent to Ireland to quell a disturbance of some kind or another. And um, the, uh, the blow, whatever it was caused by, caused him increasing difficulty. And by the time Robert was 15, he was, uh, Willie, his father Willie, was, was, had really lost his reason. And tragically, um, was eventually removed because he was considered to be a danger to his family, and he was <clears throat> he was kind of uh, he was he was put in a rented house in Dumfrieshire, where he stayed for the rest of his life under medical supervision. Um, so he became violent, basically, and he became. This all happened when Robert was a young man, um, when he was still at school. His mother's father was a wonderful character who was called Admiral Charles Elphinstone Fleming. And he could have been Hornblower or 
Jack Aubrey in the Patrick O'Brien novels. He was a, exactly of that period, a real swashbuckling admiral who went out onto the on, out, out and sailed out into the Caribbean, did exactly what he pleased. I mean, he was God on his ship, and um, uh, he was very involved in the Sp in the wars of the South American wars of liberation. And he knew the South American liberators. He knew Bolivar and Paez and was involved in negotiations with them. But he was a great character. So this is Robert's mother's, mother's father. And this was Robert's mum, Anne Elizabeth, who was born on her father's flagship off the coast of Venezuela in 1824, I think. Um, and her mother, so the Admiral's wife, was uh, a young Spanish girl who he had met in port in Cadiz, <clears throat> and he had put into port in Cadiz and took her away on his ship as his new bride. And he was 42 and she was 15. <laughs> Wouldn't get away with that. <laughs> um, so, but it was through her that Robert kind of got the Hispanic looks. Um, and he does actually look, I mean, he could have been a sitter for Velasquez, for one of the, you know, one of the Spanish, one of those Spanish. Um, classical Spanish portraitists. Um, so he had that Spanish gene and it obviously came out when he went to South America and he felt very comfortable with the language and the culture and everything. He was born in London, um, <clears throat> but with by the time, I think he's 10 there, but by the time he was only a couple of years old, they'd moved back to Scotland. And he spent most of his childhood at Gartmore. That's the other side of this, the, the, the earlier shot I showed you was Looking, looking at the, the east facing the, the front, which drops down, but that's the, that's the kind of approach. Um, so he would have spent his childhood there, and I think it would have been a wonderful place to grow up, because there was lots of land, and there was the Lake of Antif, and there were boats on the lake, and uh, lots of horses, and so he had, I think, a very free childhood, until he was sent to Harrow, Harrow School, when he was 13, um, which he later wrote that he detested because he found it snobbish. Um, so he was a very, and I'm, he's, I'm absolutely certain that it was, and he didn't like that about it at all. But he was taken away when he was only 15 because all was not well at home at Gartmore. And I mean, you know, if you're living with an elephant's skull in your front hallway, it's not surprising that you have the odd nightmare. His, his dad, by that stage, <clears throat> had become seriously, seriously mentally ill and had attacked his mother with a sword. Um, she wasn't she wasn't hurt, luckily, but that was kind of the, the the final straw. So Willie, Robert's father, was taken away and sent down to live in this house in Dumfrieshire, where he eventually died. Um, so Robert was taken away from Harrow, um, and. <sighs> Hey, after two years of going to various tutors and finishing his education, but um, not not at a, a, an expensive public school, but at sort of basically finding cheap tutors who could just help him get through the rest of his his schooling because they'd run out of money um, because Willie had spent it all before he before he finally lost his reason completely. Um, they had to let the house, and they moved into a rented house down in London, uh, and I think that it was, it was, uh, must have been devastating for him, because he was only 15, and he knew that his dad had gone mad, basically, and he also knew that they had gone, that they were broke. So it was a, it was a time of real, real catastrophe in the family, and, and, and at 15, you know, when you're, when you're developing, when you're going through all those sort of adolescent turmoil anyway, and then you have that kind of thing going on in the background. It's, it's, I, I think it must have marked him a lot. Um, and it's also understandable why he couldn't wait to get to South America, because he wanted to get the hell away from it all. And his mother, by that stage, had fallen out with her in-laws, who were trying to get their hands on the, on the estate. And there was a, there was a lot of nasty, nastiness going on. So off he went to South America, spent his time, did his six years there, came back in his late 20s, um, and a couple of years after getting back, turned up on his mum's doorstep in London with a wife who she knew nothing about. And nobody knew 
and she was called, she called herself Gabrielle de la Valmondiere, and she purported to be half French, half Chilean, an actress who he met in Paris. Um, <clears throat> she actually turned out to be a doctor's daughter from Yorkshire called Carrie Horsfall. <laughs> and she was a quite extraordinary woman. And she was, she was really as extraordinary as he was in her own way. And somebody sometime needs to write her biography as well. She had, she had run away. Her father was a medical officer in, in a small um, town in Yorkshire called Massam. Uh, and she was the oldest of 13 children. And something was going on at home, or she was simply stage struck. But I think it's more likely. I mean, the story is that she was stage struck. She ran away from home when she was 16. She was hauled back. She was caught and brought home again. She was locked up at home for a year, not allowed to go out, not even allowed to go out into the garden, except that her mother wasn't allowed to see her siblings. So she was confined to her room for the best part of a year. At the end of which, Another uh, child appeared in the family, um, which was presented as her, as her younger sister, but could possibly have been her we, we, we don't know that. She then, um, she then uh, ran away again a second time and got to London. And she, as a, as a young woman, she'd been very um, keen on making plays and she, she loved the theatre, she loved drama. She was also very spirited. And she um, got to London, and it's thought that she may have turned up on the doorstep of Henry Irving, who was the great actor and manager at the time in the late, late, 18th, late 19th century. Um, that's, what the, that's what the story goes. And his wife, who knew that he liked auditioning young ladies, um, told her in short order that the appointment was cancelled and she wasn't going to let her in. So the story stops with her on the street out, somewhere in London outside a theatrical producer's house, and nobody knows what happened for the next three years until Robert met her. So you have to think that this is a, now, she's now, she's now 17 or 18, and somehow she's living off her wits, on her own, completely unsupported. How did young women who found themselves in those kind of circumstances in the late 19th century, how did they live? I mean, we don't know. Nobody knows the answer. Um, but anyway, she meets Robert, they get married, um, and they, they go off on honeymoon. They go to Texas. Their honeymoon lasts nine months. It's a good honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> they, go, they go off to Texas, and they arrive at a place called Brown, Brownsville, which is on the border. Uh, right down on the Gulf of Mexico on the Mexican border. It, it's, it's the Texan town, the other side of the whatever the Mexican equivalent is. And they arrived there at the height of the gunslinging murder. And he writes home about seeing people being shot in the back in the street. And they hated, they obviously, they arrived there. They didn't know this is what they were going to land in. They thought they were going to set up some kind of venture of breeding mules or growing something. And of course, they couldn't wait to get away from it because it was absolutely, it was all the Hollywood films were made about that, that particular town. So they got on a wagon train going down to Mexico City. I think they may have invested in the cotton that it was carried. So they spent their honeymoon on this wagon train, 15, uh, 800, 1,500 miles, I think, from San Antonio to Mexico City. And it was very, very dangerous. And they literally circled the wagons every night, and they slept with their head to the fire and a weapon under their pillows and the wagons all around them. They got to Mexico City and they stayed there for a bit and <clears throat> um, <clears throat> then came back to San Antonio and eventually came back to, eventually came back to Britain. Um, but while they were on the train, on, you know, on, on, the, on the wagon train, Gabriela started smoking um, to keep the flies away. So you smoke strong black tobacco, probably hand rolled. And it was the only way when you were on, in the saddle all day, it was to keep the insects away. So she developed a, a, a very severe nicotine habit, and she was smoking a hundred a day at one point. And she eventually died 
uh, well, she died. She actually died of, of she had diabetes, but it was brought. It was exacerbated by by the smoking. But um, they had so they 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 spent time at once they came back to in once once Robert was able to take over Gartmore when his father died because he wasn't able to live there until his father had died because of his insanity. So there were all sorts of terrible legal problems because of the fact that his dad was basically mad but still alive. Um, so it wasn't until Robert was in his, I suppose, sort of <clears throat> mid-40s that they were finally able to take, take over Gartmore. They went and lived there. They both went their own ways. They both travelled a lot. They both wrote. She ended up writing a huge biography of St. Teresa of Avila, who was a Spanish mystic, medieval Spanish mystic. Um, but they, they, they loved Gartmore, um, and fortunately for Robert, who was, by this time, it was apparent to everybody that he was absolutely hopeless at business, she was very good at it. And that's a picture of her with, she had a, a, a Spanish maid called Peregrina. Um, and, and that's the two of them in the, in the dining room of Gartmore. She's doing the, doing the farm accounts, I think. Um, so she was good at business, luckily, and here's St. Teresa, who she wrote a huge book about, um, two volumes, 800 pages, and um, which was, which was not, um, not greatly appreciated by the Spanish authorities, because she proposed that St. Teresa's visions, and St. Teresa was a visionary of sexual in nature, um, the um, Spanish church took a very good part of that, so her book was banned in, in Spain. But um, she had she got quite a reputation as a writer for that. She died when she was only forty six, and they maintained the deception of her identity throughout her entire life. Um, and it's a it's, it's a fascinating story because by the time that they were both in their forties, they were spending time with kind of the the cultural elite of 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 um, of, of, of Britain really. So I mean all the people I mentioned earlier on, the artists, the writers, the musicians, those were the people that they hung out with in London. And they all, for one reason or another, bought into the story, or appeared to buy into the story of her identity. And it was only in the 1980s <clears throat> that my mother discovered who she actually was. Um, my grandparents knew, but weren't, were, 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 had, were, were sworn to silence. Her family knew, but they didn't say anything about it, possibly because of the, the possible scandal of the child, but possibly also because they knew more about what she'd been up to during the three missing years. So the horse falls said nothing. Um, <clears throat> and on our side of the family, nobody knew that, the, well, my mother didn't know, until eventually she persuaded my grandmother, who couldn't even bring herself to utter the name, but wrote it down on a piece of paper and put it on my mother's dressing table. And the name, I think, was Horsfall. So she was then able to make the connection because her brother officiated at her burial. Uh, and so there was, a, there was a sort of connection there that my mum was able to, to follow. So it wasn't until 1980 that it was, became, that it was in the public domain, really, that her, who she really was. She and Robert had maintained this, this, this false identity throughout, throughout their entire marriage. And she died when she was only 48. And she died of pleurisy, brought on by the smoking but. With, with diabetes as the underlying condition, and she was buried in the in the priory <clears throat> uh, on 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 the island of Itchenhoe, in the Lake of Monteith, which is where the family burial uh, place is. Uh, and uh, there's a, there's a, there's a plaque inside of the, the the abbey wall, and it's Robert apparently dug her grave the night before she, uh, she was buried, and then sat on the grave sat at the graveside and smoked a final cigarette. Before she was interred. My mother used to love telling the story that she went, um, she, once, she was on the island once when there was nobody else there, and she found a smoldering cigarette end on the, uh, on the, on the gravestone. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so anyway, to backtrack, um, Robert, in his mid-30s, he's now ready for politics. And he comes from a line of, of, of radical lairds, of, of, of Whigs in the sort of grand Scottish tradition of radicalism. Um, they, uh, his, um, his grandfathers had, had uh, oh, well, 
a great great grandfather had introduced the Bill of Rights. Um, <clears throat> Uh, his father had, had campaigned against military adventurism following the Crimean War. His mother had advised his, his, um, her sons not to vote for Disraeli. So they, 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 were, they were all leaning in the right direction, um, even if extremely privileged. Um, and when Robert, so he was heir to this tradition of, of, of radicalism, and the expectation was that he would become a liberal member of parliament. <laughs> Um, as, as a number of his four, forebears had done for Stirlingshire. And he, when he came, so he came back, so we're now into the, um, we're into the 1880s, 18, uh, yeah, 1880s, um, and he's in his mid-30s. So there are several things going on that feed into his, into, into, into his kind of, political awakening, if you like, which has begun in South America because he's seen people being very, very badly treated in South America. He's seen indigenous people being horribly treated. He's seen underclass Europeans being horribly treated. And he's, he's, he's kind of ignited a very, very strong sense of injustice and desire for social justice. So he comes back from South America with all that starting to sort of ferment so he arrives at the time of the Crofting Wars. So the, um, this, this, this was the, when the, uh, some of the lairds had started, um, had started denying their, their, their clansmen the, right, the, the ancient rights they had to, the ancient um, <clears throat> clansfolk's rights um, to land and dwellings and there was still, this was also the tail end of the clearances was still going on in the late, 19, in the late 19th century. Um, and, uh, and the Crofting Commission was meeting at around this time. And the Crofting Commission decided or determined that actually crofters didn't have any rights and they needed to have them. So, was that in London or what? And uh, it was, oh, now, I don't know actually. And Napier was the guy, he, he, Napier was the guy who chaired the Crofting Commission. And he was a Scot, but whether it happened in every other island, I'm not sure. But there was legislation introduced to give crofters rights. So he was aware of that because he was coming back to Scotland. Um, at the same time, there was uh, still a lot of disturbance going on in Ireland. And it was the time when the, 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 um, the devastation of the potato famine were kind of 20, 30 years in the past. And now tenants' rights was becoming a major issue in Ireland, and it was the beginning of the movement that would eventually result in, in, um, in Irish independence. Um, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of unrest in Ireland, so he was aware of that. He was, the, the constituency that he was proposed for was Northwest Lancashire, with Coatbridge at its heart, and Coatbridge in the late 19th century was a kind of hell on earth. I mean, it was a place where there were iron foundries, steelworks, coal mines, sky lit up all at night from the blast furnaces, smell of sulphur on the air, ground shaking from the pounding of the hammers, and people living in terrible, terrible uh, conditions and being paid nothing and working very long hours. So obviously, again, he was kind of drawn to, 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 those, to, to those people and, and their plight. Um, and so he... <clears throat> he stood in 1885 uh, as the candidate for, as a Liberal candidate for North West Lancashire and lost, but there was another election a year later um, and uh, he, won his, he won the seat <clears throat> at that election in 1886. So he became the Liberal MP for North West Lancashire. I mean, what the coal miners and steel workers and iron workers must have thought of this. I mean, he was a dandy, you know, this is, that is what he was. But he was very eloquent. He was incredibly good at dealing with hecklers. He was a great speaker um, and tremendously confident. And they really loved him. And they loved him, I think, because they recognised in him something absolutely authentic, that he was completely on their side. Um, despite all the trappings of privilege, all the background, um, <clears throat> His experiences of life, starting with travels at home, I think, had led him to, to, to feel 
to have this very, very strong sense of social justice. And I think people really recognise that. So anyway, so he was election. He was elected, and his election ticket included Scottish Home Rule, abolition of the House of Lords, nationalisation of land and key industries, an eight-hour working day, free school meals, 1886. And he was elected. When he was asked about Home Rule, he famously said, um, I would rather see my taxes wasted in Edinburgh than London. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, he was, when, he was asked, when he was asked about the House of Lords, he said, well, would you care to visit an hereditary dentist? <laughs> so he was very quick, and his maiden speech in the House of Commons was an absolute sensation, because by convention, maiden speeches, you know, you don't, you don't ruffle any feathers with a maiden speech. They're very anodyne things. And he got up and he went for everybody, including the royal family, who he said were parasites. Um, and the, the, gov the government, who he said were, um, were, were, were meddling unconscionably in other people's affairs. <clears throat> and so he had a go at everybody he possibly could. And he literally stood up and unknown and sat down half an hour later, a celebrity. And he was the talk of all the papers uh, and I mean, you know, if you go back to the paper, if you go back to the sort of daily papers of um, 1886, I forget it was November, you'll find him everywhere because he was being, he'd made such a stir in the speech and he was being reported left, right and centre. Um, he had only six years in Parliament uh, and I think he had a breakdown actually at the end of it. I think he was, abs I think he was completely burnt out. This is him later, but... He made the most of his time in London, so he cultivated the non-political friends as well, the artists and the writers. And, and his mother, by that time, was kind of living in, was, was back in London and living in London and had a salon um, where she invited young actors and artists and musicians and writers. And he met, he met sort of really everybody who was everybody. At that time, and he used to go and he used to ride in Rotten Row, which is that you know the riding um, lane in Hyde Park every day. And I mean, that's him in, in normal. I mean, you can see he's 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 being pretty righteous there, isn't he? He's got attitude, the old boy. Uh, but he sometimes used to go out in gaucho uniform just to uh, just just for a bit of show. Um, but that's that's obviously him a little bit old. So. In Parliament, only six years, three to, he was suspended three times. Once for, for swearing, which was for saying uh, the word was damn. Um, and once for, for refusing to withdraw a remark, uh, which Bernard Shaw then put into Arms of the Man, and there's a famous line when the character, I think he's Sergio Saranoff, says, I never withdraw. And this was, this was Robert, who who refused to withdraw. And then finally, in 1887, well actually finally, only a year after he'd been elected, he was involved in a riot in Trafalgar Square, which was the first um, <clears throat> of what had become many Bloody Sundays. And Bloody Sunday, 1887, what, it, what was happening was that there was, um, uh, the, 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 the dockers were being very, very poorly paid um, in the East End. And so they'd come out on strike, and while they were striking, and the, the associated workers in the East End of London, they were all coming into, they were out of work, so they were all coming into Trafalgar Square every day to meet, and there they would have, there would be, there would be speakers, and there would be people offering them help, and there would be people bringing them food, and so it was sort of, it was a rallying point, and it was a support for, for, for the out-of-work dockers. Uh, and Robert got very involved with that. Um, by that time, he he had well, actually, well, we'll come to that in a second. But um, he he was a he was a very keen champion of the striking workers because he was very pro. He was very keen on the idea of unions. He spent a lot of time in Scotland trying to organise, trying to encourage people to to to, to organise unions. So there was a there was a there was a very hard line. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner called Sir Charles Warwick who fought in the Boer War. And he didn't want these dirty layabouts converging on Trafalgar Square when the Lord Mayor's, show, uh, Lord Mayor's procession was about to happen. So he, he decided that he was going to clear them out. And basically, 
there was a riot. They were protesting on that particular occasion for freedom, the freedom of assembly, which they were about to be denied, and also for Irish Home Rule, which by that time was an actual, was, was a stated aim in Ireland. And Robert and a trades unionist called John Burns led the charge against the police. Um, and he was hit on the head and, really, and knocked down and then dragged by the hair into the centre of the square where police cordon was. And he and John Burns were then taken to um, Bow Street Magistrates Court uh, and um, all sorts of people turned up. <clears throat> to, uh, no, actually, this... This, sorry, this is the trial. This the trial came later, but they were they were they were um, they were charged with uh, uh, they were charged with unlawful assembly. There was a there was a worse charge which would have got them um, hard labour, but they they got the lesser charge, and they were both they then went to trial, and that's the trial, and they were sentenced to six weeks in Pentonville, which Robert Dooley did. Um, pretty it was a pretty awful time, I think, because he'd been hit very hard on the head, which must have worried his mother because her, her husband had had the same injury and had, you know, had ended up having terrible mental health problems as a result of it. So there was her son um, <clears throat> with a quite severe head injury um, and he'd also been kicked in the stomach and he had a bladder infection and, and so he had an awful time, I think, in Pentonville. He later wrote about it. Um, and um, <clears throat> When he came out, there was a cartoonist called Tom Merry, who was a political cartoonist today, who did this picture of him. So he's, he's looking, he's still dandy, despite the fact that he's wearing prison garb. And he was a justice of the peace in Stirlingshire, and he had that put on his business card um, as a JP. <laughs> and you can see that he's got the colour of his right cup is turned up, just a little bit, just to show a little bit of white lining. So he was ever, ever fashion conscious, was Robert. And he's, He's not looking like a man who's just spent six weeks in Pentagon, I don't think. But anyway, um, his influences were William Morris, who was very influenced by William Morris, who, who, who was the kind of, I suppose, in a way, the father of socialism, or one of the fathers of socialism. Uh, and um, he got to know Morris well and spent a lot of time with him. Um, and the other person, significant person, he met when he campaigning was, does anyone know who this is? Keir Hardy? Yeah, James Keir Hardy, who was a former miner who had become a journalist. And he was, he, he and Robert met when Robert was campaigning for the North West Lancashire seat. And they spent a lot of time together and got to know each other very well. And in 1886, they founded the Scottish Home Rule Association together. Keir wasn't at that point an MP, Robert was. Um, and then in 1887, um, they co-founded the Scottish Labour Party, which became the Independent Labour Party, which became the Labour Party. So, um, Robert and Keir Hardy were very close and political allies, and um, Robert was eventually, um, after six years, <clears throat> he was defeated in the 19. 1892 election and lost his seat. I think he probably engineered the defeat because I think he was absolutely exhausted because he'd been campaigning so hard for six years. And the big thing that they both were focusing on at that time was the eight-hour day because Rob particularly believed that if working men and women, working hours were limited to eight hours, they would then have the leisure time in which they could educate themselves. And by educating themselves, they could then ultimately achieve their own representation. So the way for them to get into Parliament was to become educated. The only way that was possible was if they didn't have to work such long hours. So his big thing throughout his whole six years, I mean, there were many things, but the big, big, the biggest thing of all was the eight-hour day. And he didn't see it during his time in Parliament, but it did come. And Keir Hardy got, it was won his first seat in the same election as Robert was defeated in 1890, in 1890, 1892. And there is um, number, membership card number one of the Scottish Labour Party, with Keir on the left and Robert on the right. 
So he'd done his he'd done his time in Parliament, and he was burnt out. Um, and he started to write. And at first, he wrote in political journals mainly, and it was very polemical stuff. He detested Queen Victoria. He referred to her as the Empress of Famine. Um, and, um, you, you know, I mean, this was, well, that's 1921, so we're talking about, well, only 30 years before that. So the globe was at its pinkest, I think, at that time. Um, so empire, he constantly wrote about empire and, and how, <clears throat> what an evil it was in the world. He was very, very against empire and particularly against its figurehead in, in Queen Victoria. Um, he wrote on a lot of subjects in those early days of writing. Um, that they were, he wrote about the things that really, that really got him riled up. And one thing particularly was the, native, the treatment of Native Americans by the American or by the US authorities. And there was a phenomenon in the 1890s called ghost dancing, which was that the, a number of tribes in the Western states believed that if they did this particular dance, it would summon the ancestors who would help them resist the white man's movement west across the states. And it was a it was a sort of, it was a, a cult thing, and there were a, a, a large numbers of Native Americans became involved in this, of all sorts of different tribes, and um, whites became very alarmed by it. Um, and the trouble culminated in the massacre of Wounded Knee in, 19, in 1891, which was when a group of unarmed Sioux men, women, and children were, were mown down by US troops. Um, and um, this rather sad photograph is the day after the massacre. It was in Dakota, South Dakota, I think. Um, and he wrote a series, he wrote three articles in a, a newspaper that was then the Daily Graphic, and he wrote about, uh, uh, he, 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 you can just feel his rage at the way that these people have been treated by the American authorities. So again, this is back to South America and that connection with the, the Native Americans that he'd met in that part of the world and this empathy that he had for, 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 for oppressed people, basically. Um, the slavery issue was interesting um, because he doesn't really make very much reference to it. Um, despite the fact that, that the wealth that his father had lost, <laughs> that he no longer had, uh, had, had undoubtedly come in the slave money. Um, but he did write a piece, um, a very shockingly titled piece, called Niggers, in which he, he savaged the Englishman's arrogance towards all the other nations on earth, not, not, not just the black races, but everybody who wasn't English, basically. Um, so he used it as a kind of metaphor for, to, 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 to show how the, the, the imperial arrogance of the English towards, um, towards the people that they considered to be their inferiors. And he wrote, um, anyway, niggers who have no cannons have no rights. Their land is ours, their cattle and their fields, their houses ours, their arms, their poor utensils and everything they have. Their women, too, are ours to use as concubines, to beat, exchange, to barter for gunpowder or gin, ours to infect with syphilis, to leave with child, to outrage, to torment, and make by contact with the vilest of our vile, more vile than beasts. So you can, you know, again, you can really hear he's, he's enraged by this. Um, so there were a lot of things, there were a lot of things that, 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 that he felt very, very, yeah, he had, a lot, he had a lot of empathy for, for, for people who were disadvantaged in whatever way. Um, and he wrote about it, and he campaigned where he could for them. Meanwhile, his writing career was moving, up, was moving on, and he was starting to be published by some American, Irish-American publisher called Frank Harris, who had a magazine called The Saturday Review, which was the magazine that everybody read. So he, his mission with that publication was to get it into every sitting room in the country. I mean, that's obviously a bit, of a bit of an exaggeration, but it was very, very widely read. And Robert started writing for it. And he was writing, and he was never really very confident that he was a good writer. 
but he was and um I mean, he was keeping company in this in this magazine with with George Bernard Shaw and H.G. Wells, amongst others. So he was he was he was highly rated by others, if not himself. So the very first book he wrote was called Notes, Notes on the District of Menteith, which sounds like a sort of rather dull local history, but actually it's a very quirky book about kind of what it meant to be Scottish in in, in around the turn of the century and. Um, observations, wry observations about local characters and local customs and, and the place. It's a, it, and people were quite captivated by it, and it actually was quite a success. That's Inchmahome, the island of Inchmahome in the Lake of Matith at the background. So over the next 30 years, he wrote about 30 books. One of his stories, which is the, probably the most famous, is one called Beatock from Moffat, and it's about an old Scotsman who is dying, who's coming back from London with his cockney wife because he wants to die at home. And his home is Moffat in the Borders in Dublin. And it's about the railway journey that they take from London, from King's Cross or wherever it is, in a steam train coming up and they come up the shaft and they get to they get to beat it where you have to change for Moffat. And the story is really about will the old man make it? And I mean, it sounds as if it could be terribly sentimental, but it's not at all. It's a really marvellous story. So if you have a if you, if, you, if you want to just a taste of what he wrote, Vitek from Moffat is the story, and I think you can find it online. Um, he had a couple more adventures to do, um, the biggest of which was in Morocco. Um, and because through, mainly through John Lavery, the portraitist, the Glasgow boy who had painted him, who'd by that time become very famous and very wealthy and had a house just outside Tangier, Robert used to go and stay with him a lot. And he got very taken by North Africa. And I think in his in, in later age, in his 50s, North Africa started, it sort of offered him what South America had when he was a young man. So adventure, intrigue. Tangier was a fascinating place in the right at the turn of the century because the, the Sultanate was corrupt and it was collapsing and they controlled the Straits of Gibraltar. So all the European powers were trying to vie for influence at the, Sultan, at the court of the Sultan, uh, knowing that it was probably about to fall and who was going to end up picking up pieces and having that very strategic place. Um, so there, was all, there were all sorts of diplomats and traders and merchants and people there and the sort of end of their tether last ditch and fixers and phonies. I mean, it was a real melting pot and Robert absolutely loved it. And there was a city in the south of the south of the Atlas Mountains called Taridat, which was forbidden because the, because of the, the weak sultanate, there was a lot of unrest in the south of the country, and they didn't want foreigners going down there stirring it up. So they had prohibited people to travel to Taridat. But Robert, being Robert, decided that he'd go there, probably was for no better reason than that he was had been told he couldn't. So he disguised himself as an Arab sheikh. Um, which he pulled off pretty well, appearance-wise, but he didn't speak a word of Arabic. So he pretended to be mad. If, when he, when he, whenever he came into contact with anybody who might want to talk to him, he would sort of look away and mumble. But he had two guides with him. And they got him up into the Atlas Mountains, um, and they were within a half a day of the summit of, of the pass that would take them down to the other side, to the city when they were rushed at by armed men, taken off and held captive by a local warlord. And they were held captive by him for three weeks up in his castle in the High Atlas. And Robert eventually managed to talk his way out and made his way back to, eventually back to England. Um, and he wrote a book about it called Maghreb El Aqsa. And Hugh McDermott, the poet, was a great admirer of his. And he reckoned that it was the best travel book ever written. I mean, I think there have probably been better ones written since, but at the time, you know, it was, it, it was, well, the thing about it was that it was a story of failure, because he didn't, didn't, he didn't get to his destination, he didn't fool anybody, he was captured, he was held to ransom, um, and it kind of went against the grain of 19th century travel writing, where the Englishman was always kind of triumphant, you know, and in this case, Robert was exactly the opposite, he, he failed on every count. But he wrote this book about it, 
And we don't really know why he was there. He might have been on a spying mission for the British government. It's possible. He might have been trying to get a trading concession, which he was always trying to do, because he was still, until his dying day, hoping that he would strike gold, make lots of money, and he never did. Um, <clears throat> or he simply went because for the hell of it. But it was a big adventure. It was his last big, really big adventure. But he, he got a book out of it, and it's a, I've read it a couple of times lately, and it's very good. It's, it's, it's an extraordinary piece of travel writing about a, an extraordinary part of the world. Um, Garper was sold in 1900. They couldn't keep it there any longer. When his father died, he inherited debts of, of today's money of about 12 million. No possibility ever of repaying. So his father had, had basically spent all the family money on improbable schemes that he was persuaded into by his brother and brother-in-law, who, who, who Robert's mother detested for that very reason. Um, so huge debts that he was never, ever going to be able to repay, and eventually he had to sell it. Um, and it had been in the family for 300 years, and I think, it, it, I think it broke his heart to sell it. But he had to. But it did free him to travel, and it freed him to write. Um, but politics was still very much in his blood, and although he kind of went quiet um, after the First World War and into the mid-twenties, he then started, when he realised that the Labour Party had kind of let go of Scotland, which is what happened in the mid-twenties. So Scottish Home Rule was a, was a Labour Party policy until 1927, I think, either 25 or 27 when Ramsay MacDonald dropped it. And I think he was very disenchanted by that time, and he felt that the party that he'd been involved in finally had kind of, it had let Scotland go. It was not, it was ignoring Scotland, and no longer had any real, real interest in Scotland. It had become too big. Um, so he, <clears throat> he turned, he turned, because of that, I think, he turned to the nationalist cause, um, and in 1928, he chaired and was the founding president of the National Party of Scotland, which was one of the two um, forerunners of the SNP. So in that photograph, you've got the Duke of Montrose on the left, Compton Mackenzie next, Robert, Hugh McDermott, and James Valentine and John McCormick, who, who were the two, they were the, the president and secretary of the Glasgow University Student Nationalist Association which was the big grassroots movement uh, of the time. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a hell of a lineup. Um, <clears throat> so he founded that in 1928. Um, and then in um, 1934, two years before he died, he was made the founding president of the Scottish National Party when it was formed. So the National Party of Scotland and there was a group called the Scotland Party. I can't remember what the other one was called, but two came together, basically, to, to form the SNP. And then he is aged probably 82 at that point, speaking at Eldersley on Bannockburn Day. <clears throat> and he continued to speak. I mean, he wasn't... He, 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 he was an old man by then, but he, he, he still had a lot of charisma. Um, and, um, I mean, he was very much a civic nationalist. He was what we today call a civic nationalist. I mean, he was, he was, the problem with nationalism at that time was that um, the, the Nazi party in Germany, you know, that was nationalism and was equated with fascism. And Robert was absolutely the opposite of a fascist. I mean, he, he, he believed that that, that, that home rule or, or independence, well, by that stage, independence, was the answer to, was the only way that Scotland's terrible social ills, and in the late 20s and 30s, I mean, there was poverty, disease, awful housing, terrible employment. I mean, you know, we were really, we were on our uppers at that, at that time. And he believed the only way this would ever, ever be ameliorated was, would, would be... Um, <clears throat> Would, would, would be through, through independence, through having our own parliament. <clears throat> so, I mean, there was nothing, there was nothing kind of, there was nothing ethnic about it. There was nothing about being, uh, there was nothing about the land. There was, there, was, there was no blood and soil nationalism about it at all. It was all about making things better for Scots. And the only way that could happen was for a parliament of Scotland run by Scots for Scots. 
So he died on a final trip to Buenos Aires in 1936. He was 84. And he'd gone back to visit the house of an old, an old Argentine friend. And he died, he got caught pneumonia <clears throat> and died. Um, and his body was actually repatriated on the ship that he booked his passage home on, in fact. Um, and his body lay in state in Buenos Aires, and the president and minister of the republic came to pay their respects. And he was taken, it was taken in a big procession down to the docks, and the procession was led by the two horses of his biographer, Amy Cefeli, who was a Swiss who had ridden those very two horses from Buenos Aires to Washington. It took him three years, and it's a very famous equestrian journey um, called Cefeli's Ride. But those were the horses, and he brought a bag of oats out from them, for them, from Britain. So he went home, his body went home, and this is, if I can make this play, Scotland and the world of letters is infinitely poorer by the passing of Mr. R. B. Cunningham Graham, whose death took place in the Argentine a month ago. The body of Don Roberto was brought by ocean liner 6,000 miles to the resting place of his forefathers, the Lairds of Gartmore, to the lovely, romantic, and hallowed Isle of Inchmahome, the Isle of Rest. With dignity and fitting simplicity, the first rites in the long farewell take place in the old church at the port of Menteith. The plaintive lament of the pipes fills the air as the mourners drawn from every section of Scottish life and including Captain Angus Cunningham Graham, Lady Brooke, Mr. Robert MacLeod and Mr. John McCormick follow the cortege to the jetty. The coffin is placed on a launch for the last short journey while the lapping waters of the lake sing a requiem. So that's him being taken across to Inch Mahone for very long. And that's his gravestone in the, beside Gabriella in the, the ruins of the Augustinian Priory on, on Inch Mahone. And you can't really quite see on this one because it's filled in with moss. You see better here the brand mark, which he had carved in instead of a religious symbol. He had, they, they, they put his brand on his gravestone. So why isn't he better known? Why isn't he better known, given all the, the, the remarkable things that he did? I mean, I think, I th I think that, that one of the reasons is that the Second World War came three years after his death. And by the time that was over, and we were into a period of austerity, I, I, I don't, think there was, don't think there was room for somebody quite so flamboyant in the, in the, in the national consciousness. He's also, um, thanks, Charlie. Don't worry, I mean, I'm at the end, so if it stops, it stops. <laughs> um, but he's, um, <clears throat> Labour, the Labour Party have written him out of their history. It's very difficult to find him, to find him in Labour Party history. And I think the reason for that is partly that he's very, he sits very awkwardly within the Labour Party because he's tough, um, but also because of the national, also because of the nationalism. And I mean, I think that's the other thing that the Labour Party finds hard to countenance. So it's convenient for them to kind of airbrush him out, despite the fact that he, you know, he, he is one of the founding fathers, if you like. Um, SNP, you know, I've talked to John Swinney about him, and I, I mean, I think, you know, they, 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 they acknowledge him. Um, but I think he's kind of regarded as a sort of slightly eccentric uncle. He's, um, he's not really given the, the place that he should. Although there's a, the, there, is, there is a there is a biography there's of, of SNP leaders, and he does feature in that. Um, but um, I mean, his legacy is really quite extraordinary, you know. So he got a Parliament restored to Edinburgh, which he which he fought for all his all, all his parliamentary career. Militant trade unionism, a Labour Party, free education, eight hour working day. Decent living standards for working people, Irish Home Rule, um, Parliament restored to Edinburgh. Uh, sorry, we've already got that, haven't we? Vote for women, recognition of the rights of animals. Very important. He got holidays for pit ponies, who otherwise lived their whole lives in the dark. Um, foundation of national parks. All of these things, they all bear his fingerprints. Um, 
And on Gabriella's, this is the this is the plaque on Gabriella's above Gabriella's grave. And at the bottom, there's a there's a Spanish <coughs> proverb, which reads "Los muertos abren los ojos a los que vive," which means the dead open the eyes of the living. Uh, and um, I can tell you that writing this book is, certainly has opened my eyes. And um, I'm still really absorbent, I think. It's such an extraordinarily rich life. But anyway, there you are. That's a, a, a counter through a huge life. And thank you for bearing with me. Um, and I'd be so very happy to ask. ask uh, Stunned you all into mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Maybe the third embarrassing thing for the present day Labour Party is that he was a socialist. Oh, well, <laughs> absolutely. Indeed. Uh, even though he was a, you know, a yes. left -left talk, but yeah. I mean, No, no, so but he was, he was a socialist. He, he really was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, he was. To the core. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's lots of passion to embarrass the Labour Party right now. But he is extraordinary. And I mean, you know, he just doesn't know. Yeah. I heard that the Lee K um, series on no, the Billy K series is really good. Has there ever been a film made of him? Uh, there was there was a TV series done about him. Um, STV Chris Stolen playwright did a uh, STV series in the early two thousands. Mm -hmm. Billy updated his radio program and it was he added an extra program and it was run. A couple of years ago, but yeah, you can get it on the iPlayer. It's very good. It's really good. I didn't them before that. Yeah, no, well, like I mean, you know, people yeah. have. And then um, there's a filmmaker called Murray Brigger who was going to make it, wanted to do a, a movie about him um, in the 90s, but they couldn't, couldn't put very some money. So, um, so, I mean, you know, if any of you have got connections in the film industry, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, it would it would make a great movie, but I think he will have trouble knowing where to put it too, because there are so many facets to his life. There's there's the politics, there's the writing, there's the travel, um, there's the whole family story. There's Gabriella, whose story is really extraordinary. You know, I mean, she was quite something. Um, so there's there are lots and lots of different threads there, and I think it, sometimes it's a bit difficult for people to kind of pin him down, but. That's that's your man. That's him. Any more questions for him? Yeah, I'm happy to prattle away about him. It's, it's all in my head at the moment. It won't be there forever. <laughs> now is the time to, to to extract it. But uh, anyway, but thank you. Listen, thank you all for coming out on a really horrible night. It's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, yes. Books for sale. If you would like to buy a book, books for sale. About I should get there with my free thing. Thanks for coming, folks. And uh, well, thank the I have our team team as well for putting this together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, folks. And uh, the bar is open at the bar. <laughs> you have to go now, don't you, Chair? Uh, yeah, I'm going up to the lobby at 9 o'clock for the traditional music session, like I do every Monday. And if you're at a loose end, that's your tune. Let's see if we get your guitar there. <laughs> see you up to the lobby if you want. Or uh, you can see it. Yeah, oops, right? You were so much.